Our interiors sometimes seem an inversion of war. Ignorance preserves us, confusion shields us when we have stepped onto the battlefield, and careful reconnaissance can lead to understanding. More dangerous to our morale and debilitating to our lives after, some suggest, than any mental wound we might take in the process. This is Nighttime Stories, and I am H.P. Knightley. This week we bring you a curated selection from a project called the SCP Foundation. Secure. Contain. Protect. Unlike our usual tales here at Nighttime Stories, the veracity of this information can neither be confirmed nor denied. We bring you this information in the hope that understanding and knowledge can only preserve us. If you fear this isn't the case, please, for what in our world is good and holy, remove this episode from your listening device and never look back. If you do so choose to listen on, please consider visiting our show notes for this week's episode and following along with the links for each excerpt. Go to nighttimestories.org slash scp hyphen selections. That's nighttimestories.org slash scp hyphen selections. Or find the link for this episode on the homepage to see a host of helpful links. Got it? If you're following along on the SCP Foundation site, please feel free to pause this recording at any point to go down a terrifying K-hole, as is appropriate for those who endeavor to secure, contain, and protect. Much of the content on this site goes well beyond the information presented here, to say the least, and is interlinked to be most helpful to you and I, the investigators. And thank you to Jackal, friend of the show. The list we read from today as well as awareness of the SCP Foundation more generally, is largely due to his help and recommendation. Wherever you are, Jackal, I hope you're safe. In his words, Like I said, some of these are pretty grim, so make sure you're in the mood for that before you dig into them. Listen on. These are selections from the SCP Foundation. Item number scp o. 87 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-087 is located on the campus of The doorway leading to SCP-087 is constructed of reinforced steel with an electro-release lock mechanism. It has been disguised to resemble a janitorial closet consistent with the design of the building. The lock mechanism on the doorknob will not release unless volts are applied in conjunction with counterclockwise rotation of the key. The inside of the door is lined with six centimeters of industrial foam padding. Due to the results of the final expiration, see document 087-4, no personnel are permitted access to SCP-087. Description SCP-087 is an unlit platform staircase. Stairs descend on a 38-degree angle for 13 steps before reaching a semicircular platform of approximately 3 meters in diameter. Descent direction rotates 180 degrees at each platform. The design of SCP-087 limits subjects to a visual range of approximately 1.5 flights. A light source is required for any subjects exploring SCP-087, as there are no lighting fixtures or windows present. Lighting sources brighter than 75 watts have shown to be ineffective, as SCP-087 seems to absorb excess light. Subjects report in audio recordings confirm the distressed vocalizations from what is to be a child between the ages of and... The source of the distress calls is estimated to be located approximately 200 meters below the initial platform. However, any attempts to descend the staircase have failed to bring subjects closer to the source. The depth of descent calculated from Exploration 4, the longest exploration, is shown to be far beyond both the possible structure of both the building and geological surroundings. This time, it is unknown if SCP-087 has an endpoint. SCP-087 has undergone four video-recorded explorations by Class D personnel. 
Each subject conducting an exploration has encountered SCP-087-1, which appears as a face with no visible pupils, nostrils, or mouth. The nature of SCP-087-1 is entirely unclear, but it has been determined that it is not the source of the pleading. Subjects exhibit feelings of intense paranoia and fear when faced with SCP-087-1, but it is undetermined whether said feelings are abnormal or simply natural reactions. Addendum. Over a period of two weeks following Exploration 4, several members of the staff and students from the <laughs> campus reported knocking at a variable rate of one to two seconds per knock coming from the interior of SCP-087. The door leading to SCP-087 has been fitted with six centimeter thick industrial padding. All reports of knocking have ceased. Authorized personnel may refer to documents 087-1 through 087-4 for transcripts of explorations 1 through 4. Item number SCP-093, Object Class Euclid, Special Containment Procedures, C. Testing Document SCP-093-T1 for Outline of Testing Conditions. SCP-093 must remain on a mirror at all times and under video surveillance. Admittance into the area of SCP-093's containment must be authorized only with proper video recording and subject retrieval procedures in place. Any attempt to use SCP-093 outside of an approved test will be dealt with severely, up to and including termination. Description. SCP-093 is a primarily red disc carved from a stone composite resembling cinnabar with circular engravings and unknown symbols carved at 0.5 centimeter depth around the entire object. Deeper cuts are present on SCP-093 with a depth of 1 to 1.5 centimeters. SCP-093 is 7.62 centimeters in diameter and fits comfortably into most palms without abrasion. SCP-093 will change hue when held by a living individual. The colors taken by SCP-093 are still being researched to establish a link. Current belief holds that the changes depend upon regrets carried by the holder. If SCP-093 is removed from a mirror and not held by a person, it will seek out the nearest mirror-like surface. SCP-093 has been observed to travel in the largest possible circle while rolling, building up phenomenal speed. The mechanism of this acceleration is currently unknown. If an obstacle is between SCP-093 and the nearest mirror-like surface, it will use this momentum to punch through the obstacle and continue on its course at this speed. It will only stop when a mirror-like surface is contacted. Despite tremendous impact velocities, no damage will be dealt to SCP-093 or the mirror. Additional Notes No record exists to clarify the nature of SCP-093's discovery or presence in the Foundation. See SCP-093-OD. Since no records exist explaining SCP-093's method of containment, a test procedure was initiated to establish why mirrors must be used to contain it. The results of SCP-093-T1 lead to the discovery of living beings holding SCP-093, being able to move through mirrors in the series of tests in SCP-093-T2 to ascertain the destination reached through this travel. SCP-093-T1 Containment Test Testing of SCP-093 against conditions set forth for existing containment procedures to access viability of continuing such containment beginning with changing the type of mirror used as a position of rest. Mirrored surface, brass frame, retail grade mirror. SCP-093 rests without activity when placed on the mirror. This test alone removes the need for costly silver 
or wooden containment systems. Standard grade table. SCP-093 turns upright and begins to roll across the table surface in one direction, making a U-turn and rolling to the other, completing an oval shape and repeating this action until a mirror is brought into vicinity of it, at which time SCP-093 rolls toward the mirror and lays flat ways against it, sliding toward the center. It is noted that despite the grainy feel of SCP-093, it does not mark the mirror in any fashion while moving across it. Two mirrors at either end of a standard grade table. SCP-093 gravitates toward the closer mirror, regardless of orientation, and makes no distinction between different types of mirrors, favoring a factor of distance above all else in choosing the mirror to move to. A mirror held by a person and moved around, SCP-093 follows the mirror as it moves, gaining speed until a maximum velocity of is reached. At any velocity, the impact of SCP-093 against a mirrored surface results in no damage to either object. A person holding SCP-093 placing it on a mirror. This test was accidental. The result of one of the staff tripping another after some debate about who would be covering the lunch tab. As a result of the behavior of the researchers, it was discovered that person holding SCP-093 and placing it against a mirror will in fact move into the mirror. Addendum. Containment testing discontinued after establishing that SCP-093 requires only a mirror to rest inert. Testing on human interaction with mirrors while holding SCP-093 authorized by Dr. Item number SCP-610. Object class Cater. Special containment procedures. Due to the vast area of infection SCP-610 covers, containment is impossible. Isolation of the area has proved far more effective and permission has been granted by the Russian government to establish a perimeter to keep people out of these areas under the guise of military operations. Should any organism displaying traits consistent with SCP-610 be sighted near this perimeter, then the established protocol requires it be engaged at range with small arms until immobile, then dispatched using incendiary weapons and munitions from as great a distance as possible. Any living thing coming in physical contact with an organism infected with SCP-610 is considered expendable and is to be immediately terminated and incinerated. Any persons coming within three miles of SCP-610 infected life are to immediately withdraw from the area, be isolated from the rest of their team, and subjected to medical examination using only remote techniques to determine if infection has occurred and appropriate steps taken based on that determination. At present, the known infection vectors for SCP-610 spread seem to be focused on physical contact. Drone movements within heavily infected areas have returned air samples containing minute particulate, which, when exposed to organic compounds, will result in an SCP-610 spread. The results of these particular tests have given most require several days to manifest, if at all, with the exception of direct contact the exposed lung and liver tissue. These particular tests show a rapid rate of growth which requires incineration of the testing environment no less than 24 hours after initial exposure, with even a two-hour mishap risking a compromised facility event. Given that this kind of rapid growth only occurs in organic material existing outside the human body, this form of infection is at current considered a minor concern. These peculiarities have given rise to a series of questions regarding the possible origin of the infection in conjunction with the failed <laughs> containment protocol remains at a scorched earth policy at this time and no concern for transmission by a water or air at infection parameters exists barring situational changes in the field description initial reports of SCP-610 came direct from the Russian government through undisclosable channels. These reports consisted primarily of disappearance of farmers 
in the region and were not considered until the local police, followed by the regional police, and finally a government dispatched agent, all failed to report in within a 72-hour period. A small military contingent was dispatched to the area and quickly withdrew at which point the Foundation was contacted to investigate. The area SCP-610 affects is close to Lake Baikal in southern Siberia. Areas of known infection are marked on a map provided. Containment perimeters are marked in blue surrounding these infection areas, and as of present no further locations have been identified. Incursions into the perimeter must be reported prior to conducting, confirmed during exploration, and debriefed on immediately following return. SCP-610 appears to be a contagious skin disease at first, with symptoms including rash, itching, and increased skin sensitivity. Within three hours, the disease will cause blemishes, resembling heavy scar tissue to form in the chest and arm areas, spreading to the legs and back within an additional hour, consuming the victim completely within five hours. Exposure to higher temperatures vastly decreases the time for the contagion to spread, and complete infections have been recorded occurring in as little as five minutes. After the completion of the infection occurs, the victim's life functions will cease for approximately three minutes, after which time they will restart at two to three times the activity rate of a normal human. Following this, the scar tissue on the victims will start to move of its own accord and grow at a rapid rate. Normal human features start to disappear at this point under the infection, and the path of the mutation appears to be largely random. Subjects observed in this stage of infection have been recorded as growing three or more limbs of a type such as arms or legs. The head may become misshapen and elongate or widen out, and parts of the subject may split open, from which additional branches of flesh will grow. The duration of this stage of infection is unknown, and not all subjects appear to progress to later stages. Under unknown conditions, an infected individual will cease moving and place itself in a location it deems suitable, where it roots itself. The fleshy growth on the victim will then begin to spread itself across all surrounding objects and consume them. Such objects do not spread the infection as living creatures do, however, and the effect of prolonged contact with these objects is recorded later in this document. It is assumed that this behavior is to create an area hospitable to continued growth of the other infected. Observation of life infected by SCP-610 by staff is impossible. Those infected with the disease immediately seek out aid as natural human impulse, resulting in unintended infections. Those infected pass the scar tissue phase, actively and aggressively attempt to infect anyone approaching them within an undefined area. It has been established that should an infected be capable of sight, and observe an uninfected, it will proceed toward them. If the infected has lost the ability of sight, a range of approximately 30 meters is considered safe. Observation of SCP-610 infected settlements has been established using artificial methods such as remote robots. The data returned from these observations, coupled with the openly aggressive nature of the infected, to attempt to spread SCP-610 has resulted in the Cater classification. However, so long as nothing is allowed to enter or leave the infected areas, it is considered a neutralized threat. Of concern are the cavernous areas beneath the infected settlements that were discovered during the exploration, and attempts to get research personnel into these areas are underway. Item number... SCP-1983, Object Class Cater, Presumed Neutralized, Special Containment Procedures. Outpost 54 has been built on the land surrounding SCP-1983 and disguised as a chemical plant. The plant building serves as barracks for MTF Chai-13, Choir Boys. All entry points into Outpost 54 are to be guarded at all times. Personnel will review document 1983-12 
which details the cover story to be given to any civilians expressing curiosity. All MTF personnel must profess strong religious beliefs per Chai 13 protocols. All ammunition stocked must have a silver or silver-tipped projectile. A 24-hour watch is to be maintained on the front door of SCP-1983-1. Guards are to engage any instances of SCP-1983-2 on site. No personnel is to approach within 5 meters of SCP-1983-1 outside of scheduled testing protocol. Update. Following the event 1983-23, a stand-down of Outpost 54 has been authorized. A skeleton crew will remain to monitor SCP-1983 for any further activity. Arms intended for use against instances of SCP-1983-2 are to be maintained at Outpost 54 Armory. Description SCP-1983-1 is a one-story farmhouse in County, Wyoming. It was abandoned in 1968 after a series of ritual murders, allegedly performed by a satanic cult. Please see capture logs for scp for further details. The front door of SCP-1983-1, when opened, appears to contain a spatial anomaly. Neither matter nor light has been observed to exit the doorway, save for instances of SCP-1983-2, though the anomaly is exothermic. SCP-1983-1 is accessible through other entrances, including windows, the back door, and entrances cut into the back of SCP-1983-1. However, the front room does not appear to exist inside of SCP-1983-1. Doors that should lead to the front room instead lead to other doors inside the building. Measurements of the inside and outside of SCP-1983-1 are inconsistent. Holes cut through the interior walls of SCP-1983-1 that should lead to the front room lead instead to the outside walls around the front of SCP-1983-1, but stop 10 feet on either side of the doorway. Attempts to drill into the front room of SCP-1983-1 from the outside have led to the exposure of smaller portions of the anomaly, though instances of SCP-1983-2 have not been observed to exit them. Further attempts to breach the wall have been forbidden by 05-03, due to the possibility of allowing increased potential for instances of SCP-1983-2 to appear. SCP-1983-2 are bipedal creatures, approximately 1.8 meters tall. They are vaguely humanoid and entirely black in color. They are highly aggressive and will engage any human on sight. When an instance of SCP-1983-2 comes into contact with a human, they extend an upper limb into the human's chest cavity without any apparent damage to skin or tissues. Through means unknown, they then extract the heart, killing the human. Once it has acquired a human heart, an instance of SCP-1983-2 will return to SCP-1983-1. Silver munitions fired while offering prayer is the only known method of killing SCP-1983-2. The precise form of the prayer or religion of the supplicant does not appear to matter, so long as the prayer is sincere. Once killed, the bodies of SCP-1983-2 appear to evaporate, leaving a small layer of sulfur. SCP-1983 was discovered after a series of mysterious deaths in the vicinity of County. Foundation investigators encountered instances of SCP-1983-2 and were able to trace them back to SCP-1983-1. Addendum 1. A team from MTF Chai-13 was sent through the front doorway to attempt to investigate the anomaly. They did not return. However, shortly after they entered, the front door appeared, closing in the frame. No further manifestations of SCP-1983-2 appeared. 
Addendum 2. A second assault team entered SCP-1983-1 to determine the fate of the first assault team. They did not return. The door did not close. Shortly after new manifestations of SCP-1983-2 appeared, Agent Morris entered the doorway, which closed shortly after. Addendum 3. On May 23, 1989, D-14134 was given a closed-circuit camera tethered to a monitor by a 25-meter cord. He was instructed to examine as much of the area as he could, and then attempt to return. Once through the doorway, feed from the camera was interrupted. The cord was pulled taut and then snapped. Several hours afterward, the anomaly in SCP-1983-1 disappeared. Inside, the desiccated remains of several agents were discovered, as well as document 1983-15, an informal SCP report written by an agent within the anomaly. It appears as follows. Item number SCP-184, Object Class Euclid, Special Containment Procedures, SCP-184 is not to be contained in any structure. SCP-184 is to be attached to a high-power electromagnet at all times. Should the electromagnet fail, agents are to report to SCP-184's containment area and prevent access to all unauthorized personnel until the electromagnet is restored to power. The containment area for SCP-184 is currently configured to resemble a park, with SCP-184 and its containment magnet disguised as statuary. Any and all visitors are to be monitored. Any structures affected by SCP-184 are to be demolished after review by... Final demolition approval or inclusion into SCP will also be determined by this body. No investigation is to be done into affected structures without approval and a rescue team on standby. Description. SCP-184 is a small, smooth, metallic object, 10 centimeters tall and 10 centimeters wide, in the shape of a dodecahedron. Each face of the figure has a circular hole in the center, and a small sphere is attached to each vertex. SCP-184 is made of an unknown but highly magnetic alloy about as hard as brass. When inside an enclosed structure, SCP-184 expands the structure's inner dimensions without altering its outer dimensions. SCP-184 will increase the inner dimensions of any enclosed structure by several hundred meters each day, beginning one hour after entry into the structure. Initially, SCP-184 only extends the walls out, causing rooms to become much larger without adjusting the height of the room. This expansion continues until the original dimensions of the room have been tripled. At this point, SCP-184 starts creating wholly new rooms. SCP-184 is apparently able to copy items from inside the structure, creating furnished rooms consistent with the rest of the structure. After a period of time, however, the expansion process appears to break down. For example, items will be made from inappropriate materials, glass books, a wooden microwave. Rooms will be oddly shaped. Doors will open into blank walls, and hallways will be tiny or twist back around in long mazes. The new inside structures continue to be more and more odd, while the outside remains unchanged. This behavior is most dramatically illustrated in homes, however it has been observed in other instances, including a cardboard box. The changes do not go away with the removal of SCP-184, but no additional structures are created. Addendum 184-1, notes from Dr. I don't think I need to stress the fact that this thing can never be allowed into Site-19. We may need to look into different containment at some point, but for the time being, we will keep it in the open, immovable, and hidden. Addendum 184-38RB, Notes on Recovery 
SCP-184 was recovered in the Kowloon Walled City in the June of... Reports of the city's bizarre and explosive growth attracted operatives who soon learned of SCP-184, held in the possession of... After several police crackdowns, Mobile Task Force Zeta-9 was dispatched and recovered SCP-184 with minimal losses. The final effect of exposure to SCP-184 on both the city and inhabitants may never fully be understood due to the reckless actions of local law enforcement, which destroyed several affected sections of the city before operatives could take action to prevent it. Interviews with residents yielded minimal information, with a communal wall of silence being the major response. A few documents indicated that SCP-184 could be brought into a home, and allowed to affect the dwelling for 50 pounds sterling per half hour. These documents were unconfirmed by residents. Item number SCP-914, Object Class, Safe, Special Containment Procedures, Only Personnel Who Submit a Formal Request and Receive Approval from Site Command May Operate 914. SCP-914 is to be kept in Research Cell 109B, with two guard personnel on duty at all times. Any researchers entering 109B are to be accompanied by at least one guard for the entirety of testing. A full list of tests to be carried out must be given to all guard personnel on duty. Any deviation from this list will result in termination of testing, forcible removal of personnel from 109B, and formal discipline at site command's discretion. Warning. At this time, no testing of biological matter is allowed. Refer to document 109B-117. Applying the rough setting to explosive materials is not advised. Description of SCP-914. A large clockwork device weighing several tons and covering an area of 18 square meters consisting of screwdrivers, belts, pulleys, gears, springs, and other clockwork. It is incredibly complex. Consisting of over 8 million moving parts, comprised mostly of tin and copper, with some wooden and cloth items observed. Observation and probing have shown no electronic assemblies or any form of power other than the mainspring under the selection panel. Two large booths, 3 meters by 2.1 meters by 2.1 meters, are connected via copper tubes to the main body of SCP-914, labeled intake and output. Between them is a copper panel with a large knob with a small arrow attached. The words rough, coarse, one-to-one, fine, and very fine are positioned at points around the knob. Below the knob is a large key that winds the mainspring. When an object is placed in the intake booth, a door slides shut and a small bell sounds. If the knob is turned to any position and the key wound up, SCP-914 will refine the object in the booth. No energy is lost in the process and the object appears to be in stasis until the output booth door is opened. Intense observation and testing have not shown how SCP-914 accomplishes this, and no test object has ever been observed inside SCP-914 during the refining process. The process takes between 5 and 10 minutes, depending on the size of the object being refined. Addendum 514, Dr. <laughs> test Log Input 1 kilogram of steel, setting rough. Output File of steel chunks of various sizes, appearing to be cut by laser. Input, 1 kilogram of steel, setting 1 to 1. Output, 1 kilogram of steel screws. Input, 1 kilogram of steel, setting fine. Output, 1 kilogram of steel carpet tacks. Input, 1 kilogram of steel, setting very fine. Output, Several gases that dissipated into the air quickly, and one gram of an unknown metal, resistant to heat of 50,000 degrees, 
impossible to bend or break with any force, and a near-perfect 1.6 times 10 to the 75th row conductor of electricity. Input. One wristwatch, belonging to Dr. <laughs> setting course. Output. One completely disassembled wristwatch. Input. One cell phone belonging to <laughs> setting one-to-one. -one. Output. One cell phone, although different make and model. Input. One standard Colt Python revolver. Setting very fine. Output. <laughs> Aforementioned. Completely disintegrated all matter in its line of fire. Object contained with high density gamma waves. Input. One white mouse. Setting. One to one. Output. One brown mouse. Input. One chimp. Setting fine. Output. Input. One chimp. Setting rough. Output. Badly mutilated corpse. Showing signs of crushing and cutting with high heat. Document number 109-B117. Dr. and Dr. Test log. Input. Subject D186. Male Caucasian, 42 years old, 108 kilograms, 185 centimeters tall, setting 1 to 1. Output, male Hispanic, 42 years old, 100 kilograms, 188 centimeters tall. Subject was very confused and agitated. Subject attacked security personnel. Subject terminated. Input. Subject D-187, male Caucasian, 28 years old, 63 kilograms, 173 centimeters tall, setting very fine. Output. Subject escaped from test chamber, killing eight guards, as well as Dr. and Dr. Lockdown initiated. Subject causes containment failure of three SCP areas in continued escape attempt. Special response team engages subject, resulting in severe wounding of subject, partial memory loss in special response team members, and corrosive damage to plumbing. Subject expired several hours later, dissolving into blue ash and blinding nearby research team. Biological testing with SCP-914 discontinued. Item number SCP-229, Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. No electrical devices of any kind are allowed inside or within 30 meters of the containment area. Any and all personnel entering the containment area are to be clad in lead-lined clothing and helmets. Anything found to be infested by SCP-229 is to be immediately incinerated, and the resulting ash and debris contained and disposed of under protocol XJR-99. Containment area is to be composed of a hollow cube of 18 centimeters thick granite, 8 meters on a side, with a single door and airlock. These are to operate with no electrical components, and those components are to be made of wood or stone whenever possible. Any organism infested with SCP-229 is to be immediately incinerated, the items or staff exiting the containment area must be scanned and cleared by site security. Description SCP-229 appears to be a mass of wires and cables. Superficially, they appear to be raw copper wire, insulated Ethernet cable, phone cable, power lines, and many other forms of electrical cable. The current mass weighs 94 kilograms at last measurement. SCP-229 is tentatively identified as a form of silicon-based life. SCP-229 is a highly invasive parasite, attacking anything carrying even a low level of electrical current. SCP-229 will grow several centimeters every hour and form connectors to attach to electrical power sources, wall socket plugs, USB connectors, etc. SCP-229 will also splice itself into power lines and existing wires, if no connection is available. SCP-229 appears to feed off electricity. 
SCP-229 appears to go dormant when not in the presence of an electrical source. Any electrical current entering within 30 meters, no matter how small, will immediately cause SCP-229 to grow in the direction of the electricity. Questions regarding the possible intelligence and sense organs of SCP-229 are still under investigation. SCP-229 appears to grow best on metal or plastic, but is very capable of infesting living tissue. In vertebrate animals, SCP-229 will quickly penetrate the epidermis and other tissues, attaching to and enveloping the spine. SCP-229 will then grow along the nerve pathways and up into the brain, attaching and infesting it within a few days. This process appears to be extremely painful and can cause very erratic behavior. When the infested subject nears death, usually from massive internal bleeding and brain damage, SCP-229 will exit the body by puncturing through the skin and attaching to any nearby structures, thus beginning the cycle again. It is theorized that SCP-229 has always been present in our ecosystem, that the technological level, and thereby the availability of electricity, was insufficient to allow its spread. With the current prevalence of wires and other electrical devices, detection can be extremely difficult. Incineration is currently the best means for SCP-229 removal. Addendum. At this time, cross-examination between SCP-229 and SCP-217 is allowed only with O5 approval. Hello? This is H.P. Knightley again, closing out this week's episode. It has been a selection of recordings from the SCP Foundation. You can find them on the web at scp-wiki.net if you have not already. Their database is extensive and well-organized. Go and support them and the work they do to keep you safe from what is out there tonight, beyond the light or sound of your audio device. Thank you for listening. Feel free to tweet about the show. I'm at HP Nightly, or subscribe to our feed at nighttimestories.org slash feed, or on iTunes. This has been Nighttime Stories. The content of this week's episode from the SCP Foundation was released under a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license, as is this episode of Nighttime Stories from Thusali Media. Next week, something different, something the same. But remember, there is no truth here.